So let me uh, remind you where we were and uh, continue from there. So la last time I, I formulated uh, the two cosmic censorship conjectures, what I called uh, weak cosmic censorship. And uh, I, I only formulated this in the context of, of vacuum, um, just for, if you want, for clarity. So uh, the formulation was, and I'll just write again the statement of the conjecture. So for generic asymptotically flat initial data then uh, let me write the uh, vacuum here. Okay. Then the maximal Cauchy development has a complete future null infinity. Okay. So I'll, let me just write. Possesses a complete future null infinity. So this was what what I called weak cosmic censorship, and I also formulated something called strong cosmic censorship. I, I will make a comment about these epithets weak and strong in just a second. Uh, so this uh, so the beginning is the same. So let me not write it again. So for generic asymptotically flat. Vacuum initial data, comma, the maximal Cauchy development. So is future and extendable as a suitably regular Lorentzian manifold. So first of all, if you want the slogan for what the first says, then uh, the, the first conjecture says that generically in gravitational collapse, if there is geodesic incompleteness, which we know sometimes does occur and is stable, all right, then it only occurs in black holes. But you notice I'm not <laughs> referring directly to the notion of black hole. I'm simply isolating the good feature of black hole that in the notion of black hole that I want, I always have a complete null infinity, and I'm just keeping this feature. Okay? So you can think about this way cosmic censorship as the statement that generically any incompleteness is associated with black holes, but uh, I'm even giving you a slightly weaker statement, which is cleaner. Okay? That uh, like the black holes that we know and love, future null infinity uh, is complete. Okay. So asymptotic observers in the wave zone can observe forever. All right, that was what this conjecture was saying, in essence. The strong cosmic censorship conjecture, ag again, in if you want a slogan, all right, um, then the slogan is that for generic initial data, the space-time, which is uniquely determined by initial data, that is, after all, what this maximal Cauchy development is, that is the biggest space-time that you can possibly attach to initial data. You cannot extend this further. Okay? So sometimes uh, y y strong cosmic censorship is formulated as the statement that space-time is globally hyperbolic. Uh, well, <laughs> the semantic relation between that type of a statement and this is, you see, the, the maximal Cauchy development is by definition globally hyperbolic. Okay, so this is the statement that this maximal Cauchy development is an extent. Okay, so but it, it's important to state things like this because uh, only in the context of sort of the Cauchy problem can you rationally discuss this notion of of generic. Okay. So these are the two statements, and the final comment I want to make is that well. It's not uh, clear why this is called weak and this is called strong. These statements, as I've stated them, do not have any logical 
relationships. So these are traditional epithets. Uh, in particular, the strong one does not imply the weak one. And uh, in, in the context of what I'll tell you today, we'll sort of, uh, I, I hope that you'll see the sort of relation of these statements, which are in some sense the right way to formulate these, with various uh, pictures one might have in mind, what, what are naked singularities, sort of what are counterexamples or potential counterexamples to sort of what one is trying to prove here. Okay. All right, so uh, this is one statement that I want to make uh, at the beginning. And, and the other sort of introductory comment I want to make is the following. Um, so when these were formulated and sort of these uh, statements, though not exactly this form, uh, are first formulated by, by Penrose, there was an implicit hope that sort of <laughs> the proof of these statements may be just around the corner. In particular, uh, these statements uh, could be proven using the methods of uh, what are known as the singularity theorem, so Penrose's incompleteness theorem that we discussed last time. That's to say that some very soft, purely geometric argument all right, would be able to tell you that these statements are true. Okay. And one of the things that, and indeed there was sort of a flurry of initial activity, uh, which indeed was trying to look at these statements from that point of view. Uh, one, one of the things that became clear very quickly, however, is that these are statements about the, finally, the, the partial differential equations and their sort of wave-like uh, properties near potential singularities. Okay? So these are really questions about the Einstein vacuum equations. They are not questions about uh, space-times that satisfy a, an inequality, a certain curvature condition. Okay? Um, these are really statements about the Einstein vacuum equations, and only by coming to terms with the analysis of sort of general solutions of these equations will you will you be able to make progress and either prove or or disprove these these uh, conjectures. And um, and of course, this is why the subject is so hard because um, just to put this into some context, the Einstein vacuum equations are highly nonlinear system of partial differential equations um, where the, if you want, the <laughs> dimension of the uh, independent variables is four. Okay, so there's this complicated system of nonlinear hyperbolic, as we discussed last time, partial differential equations in, in, in four space-time dimensions. And in general, there, there really are, are, are no uh, examples of nonlinear equations of this type uh, for which anything about sort of general singularities that occur is understood. Okay. So this is a very difficult type of problem in, in analysis, and certainly there are other equations with which you can compare. I mean, most famously and older, the, the Euler, the uh, compressible Euler equations of, of, of fluid mechanics. Um, and really nothing is known about what types of singularities form in, in somehow in, in three plus one dimensions. Nothing is known. So somehow in that backdrop, it's, <laughs> it's sort of not surprising that, um, that these problems are difficult. Uh, actually, that backdrop at first sight, you might think that <laughs> you should just abandon discussion of these problems. Uh, they will never be solved mathematically. But actually, we, we, we have reasons to believe that of all nonlinear hyperbolic equations of mathematical physics, uh, the Einstein equations may be the best behaved somehow. And the reason is because of their very, very rich structure. So uh, I, I am optimistic that these uh, questions will be resolved either in the affirmative or in the negative in you know, sort of in a relatively short period by mathematical standards, which maybe could mean 100 years or so. But I, I am very optimistic that this, this type of question is the type of question that, that uh, the mathematical analysis of PD can, can indeed hope to answer. Okay. So what, what I want to talk for the rest of the time today is sort of, well, why, why we tentatively, quote, believe that these conjectures may be true, um, and what types of mathematical results 
we do have in the direction of these uh, conjectures. And essentially what I'll mean by a result in the direction of this uh, conjecture is a sort of a, what you could call toy proxy problems, okay, that capture uh, some of the difficulties that one perceives are in this are in these conjectures, but uh, obviously do not <laughs> resolve in the affirmative or the negative of these conjectures per se. So what what will the toy proxy problems be? Well, essentially all that we know about these conjectures um, involves looking in in spherical symmetry. So what I want to do is I want to consider what I could call the reduced conjectures, where I assume that everything in sight is spherically symmetric. So I'm not going to look at generic data. I'm going to look at generic spherically symmetric data. Okay. But of course, uh, <laughs> all of you probably know that um, uh, in the case of the vacuum equations for which I formulated these conjectures for simplicity, in the case of the vacuum equations, well, there's not much to do here in spherical symmetry because the only vacuum uh, solutions of the, of the uh, Einstein equations in spherical symmetry are parameterized by, by the Schwarzschild family. So you can sort of, you know, the, the Schwarzschild family tells you sort of that in that context, say these conjectures are trivially true. So that's not going to give us any intuition. So all intuition has uh, come from, OK, going to spherical symmetry, but now making the problem more interesting by coupling particular mother models. Now, of course, you could say that, well, this, this is the problem anyway. OK, that's to say, you know, I, I formulated this only for the vacuum because I did not want to discuss what type of mother models to consider, which ones should I expect the conjecture be, to be true, et cetera, et cetera. But you could say, and it's certainly the case, that yeah, you know, you <laughs> in, in principle, you, 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 you wanted to consider this anyway. But the purpose of uh, mother uh, in this talk will not be because I have a specific uh, uh, physical motivation for the specific mother, the mother is here, if you want, as a proxy for uh, aspects of the phenomenology of vacuum collapse okay, that would have been killed in, in spherical symmetry. Okay? So this somehow is why one is doing this, but of course okay, you can also think of the mother as actual mother and you can think of it like this also. So uh, somehow I, I'm going to show you a sort of a sequence of uh, models of uh, more and more complexity, all right, which, uh, in which these problems can be, can be studied and resolved, and which shed light on sort of well <laughs> various aspects of the problem in the full vacuum case, and in particular will explain why we have conjectured them like this. And uh, I'm actually going to be forced to maybe add some words to this conjecture here uh, that, um, well, are, are motivated by what will come out of this. So, uh, OK, having said this, now <laughs> I wish I was taller. But um, all right. So let me begin with the, the first model. So maybe uh, let me make one comment about these models before saying anything. That, so in general these models, that's to say Einstein coupled with specific mother field, satisfying Einstein equations, coupled with the equations that the mother field satisfies, these will again be nonlinear hyperbolic PDEs. Okay, so in, in some sense, we haven't changed the fundamental mathematical nature of the problem. All right, so we're still trying to understand the sort of generic solutions of these nonlinear hyperbolic partial differential equations. What changes, however, is that they are now in, effectively, they become 
PD is in one plus one dimension. Okay, so two space-time dimensions, or one space and one time. So it's not obvious actually why this should be such a big simplification a priori. But it, it turns out that uh, hyperbolic partial differential equations, um, they have much more structure in two space-time dimensions than in any integer strictly greater than two. Okay. So it turns out that it's, it's actually it's because of fundamental facts about even just linear ways in two dimensions that this, the structure here is much, much richer and one can exploit the structure to, to make progress in principle. Okay. So uh, in particular, reducing the problem to two plus one dimensions would be of no help. Okay. If you can somehow, <laughs> if you can do two plus one, you can do n plus one. All right. So it's really, this, this is really the place where partial differential equations hyper of hyperbolic type uh, become easier. Okay. And actually, it's sort of similar in for elliptic theory for different but not completely unrelated reasons. So it's two, two dimensions is special. OK. So uh, this being said, let me talk about the first model. So actually, the first model is not, in some sense, it turns out that it's even easier than this. It, secretly reduces to ordinary differential equations. And actually, it was first considered by, by Lemaitre. Um, and then Tolman, Oppenheimer, Snyder, etc. Namely, you look at the Einstein equations and couple it to a dust. So I, I mean, actually, to <coughs> relativistic Euler, but uh, where in the equation of state, you, you set the, the pressure to equal to 0. So, um, so it turns out that uh, this, this system um, in spherical symmetry, even, even though a priori it should be 1 plus 1 dimensional PDs, it becomes ODs. Okay? And because of that, it could be sort of studied and was studied sort of already in the, in the 20s and 30s, if you want. And in particular, uh, out of this study came out the famous Oppenheimer-Snyder spacetime that I drew last time. Let me draw it again. So this space-time, in the sense of the Cauchy problem, so I'm always going to draw initial data first. So this is the asymptotically flat initial data. So this is a spherically symmetric picture. So you should think that there's some area radius coordinate r. So this is r equals 0. This is the center of spherical symmetry. And this is infinity. Okay, this is where null infinity will come out when we start evolving the data. And uh, well, the, the data is uh, actually <laughs> not only spherically symmetric, but you have an initial, initially homogeneous ball of dust. So the density is constant here, surrounded by vacuum. So this is the, the data. Okay. And well, in the sort of language of Penrose diagrams, uh, what uh, Oppenheimer-Snyder So I guess this was 1939. What they showed is that, well, if you evolve this, so again, of course, this discussion is revisionist. And the usual apologies apply, but uh, <laughs> I will use sort of all this modern te uh, terminology. So what they showed is the following, that the, the support of the dust in space-time looks something like this. Okay. Outside the support of the dust by Birkhoff's theorem, the solution is Schwarzschild. So if you remember Schwarzschild, you know that Schwarzschild has this complete null infinity. Okay. And the Penrose diagram of what you get looks like this. So this is precisely dynamic formation of a black hole through the collapse of, you can think of this as a star, okay. dust star. So dust star collapse like this outside this Schwarzschild. And this area here 
is the complement of the past of this complete future null infinity. This is your black hole. Okay. So of course, if you want, the very notion of black hole dynamically forming uh, came out uh, from from this paper. So this paper, in fact, if you want, this was really. Uh, <laughs> this is why, in some sense, we we <laughs> originally came to believe in the notion of, of, of black holes. They sort of were something that formed naturally, dynamically. Okay. So this, this data in particular is completely <coughs> sort of, at least, ab initio, it looks uh, completely reasonable. OK, this is, this is a, a particular solution of the Einstein dust system. Let's now ask ourselves, uh, for the spherically symmetric <laughs> Einstein does system, are, are these conjectures true? So uh, let, let me note, by the way, that both of, these both of these predicates are true of this particular solution. So future null infinity is complete. So the, the length of this, in some sense of that word, is infinite. And the spacetime is future and extendable, just like Schwarzschild was, okay? Because somehow all, uh, if you want, all observers who live only for finite time are destroyed. Okay. And if the space-time were extendable, then at least some of those observers would have to be able to pass into the extension. Okay. And that's a contradiction if, if this extension is in any sense regular. Okay. So this solution is completely consistent with this picture. So now you can ask, are these conjectures true for the spherically symmetric Einstein dust model? That's to say, let's not start with uh, homogeneous um, dust ball, let's allow a spherically symmetric density function which is not homogeneous and ask ourselves if this is true for generic initial data. So, um, so one big surprise, and this is an early result of uh, Christoph Hulu from 1983, is that uh, both of these conjectures are false for this model. So uh, what he showed is that there are open sets in the moduli space of initial data. Okay? In fact, there's really a sense in which, you know, essentially, most initial data will look like this. But anyway, in any case, open sets in the moduli space. All right. Uh, with the property that if you look at their Cauchy evolution, then there will be a central first singularity here. Okay. And you can construct various examples, but in, in particular, uh, there are open sets which will lead precisely to this picture. Okay. So this will be the Penrose diagram. It will look like this. This will not be complete, so this will be incomplete because it's somehow cut off by this outgoing null cone. Okay. But uh, this will be regular. All right. So in particular, uh, you can extend the spacetime beyond this. Okay. So in particular, this uh, because these are open sets in the moduli space, I'm not saying that there's some spacetime that looks like this. I'm saying that <laughs> there's a spacetime that looks like this, and any spacetime sufficiently close to it initially looks like this. Okay? So uh, I have, in some sense, this, this theorem disproves in that model both, both of these uh, conjectures, the weak cosmic censorship because this is incomplete, the strong cosmic censorship because I can uh, pass beyond this. Um, now, let me just, because if, if these formulations are confusing, uh, if your vision, so think of this as a naked singularity. And it's a naked singularity because you draw this, this sort of null cone on the boundary of space time. Okay, you can think of it as Cauchy horizon. It intersects null infinity, or it intersects sort of the continuation of null infinity if you were to continue. <coughs> now, it's better to always refer just to the globally hyperbolic development, in which case the way you characterize this is that null infinity is incomplete. Okay? Now, in many discussions, you think of coming from here is some now time-like singularity in a non-globally hyperbolic space-time 
and people say that cosmic censorship means that there should be no time like singularity. But uh, so <laughs> to talk about that, then you're already talking about the particular way in which you're extending and the particular way in which you're extending this. So this is not the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is in terms of the, the well-defined object that does arise from initial data, okay, that somehow null infinity here is cut off, and that uh, you can extend this beyond a Cauchy horizon. Okay. So this is, one should get used to these formulations. Okay. All right. Well, OK, so <laughs> maybe the story should end here then, because this is the simplest model. And already, um, and already <laughs> the, the conjectures are false. But, well, actually, uh, you can say something about this first singularity. And what you can say is the following, that uh, what happens here is that the, the density becomes infinite. And You know, you, you can probably put together a story that says that the, the, the dust model is a reasonable mother model under some conditions, but uh, <laughs> somehow those conditions, whatever they are, uh, are that in some sense this, this uh, density rho is small. I mean, if you think sort of in terms of the more any sort of more realistic equation of state, then the pressure should become infinite as the density becomes infinite. And of course, in the dust model, the pressure is 0. Okay. So th that's to say that um, you can reasonably hold out hopes that in, in, a, in a better model with a more realistic equation of state, um, then um, the mother equations would not allow this to happen. Okay? And maybe the picture is different. Okay. So. Um, let, let me just say, though, that non nonetheless, there is a certain, we, we will take this point of view and hope that uh, this happened because the model, the mother model, was bad and not because sort of this is a real physical phenomenon. This is, by the way, uh, one of the reasons that uh, here I've only conjectured the, uh, these two statements for the vacuum case. Uh, this example, in some sense, already tells you that uh, if, you know, if you just put any mother, even mother, satisfying a reasonable equation in some sense of that word, these statements will not necessarily be true. Of course, there is some irony in that all our understanding or our original understanding of the black hole notion comes from a model in which actually the more prevalent end state is naked singularity. But okay. So, well, you could go to, a, again, an Einstein-Euler a fluid model with a more realistic equation of state. But actually, that's very, very hard. And the reason is that, well, fluids in general, they form shocks. That's OK in the sense that we know that solutions continue beyond shocks in a physical way. But uh, the theory of how to deal with that, even though there's been a lot of work on it, is still not sufficiently developed to really be able to handle even in spherical symmetry, so even in 1 plus 1 dimensions, uh, general solutions of the Einstein-Euler equation. So this should give you an idea of how difficult certain questions in, in partial differential equations are. So it turns out that there is sort of a, a simpler model uh, than the general uh, fluid that you can take, and that's the model of a, of a scalar field, Einstein scalar field. So this, this model was really sort of introduced by Christodoulou in, well, in some sense, actually, in, in, in his thesis, even. And he sort of has studied it over the years until 2001. So let me tell you what, uh, what you can show for this model. Okay, again, everything, we are always in, in, in spherical. Originally, you might have hoped that this type of naked singularities, that's to say solutions with uh, incomplete future null infinity, never occur in this model. So one of the first surprises is that, well, in, in this model, uh, 
you can also get precisely this Panos diagram. Okay, so there are solutions um, for the Einstein scalar field model that arise from regular initial data. Okay, so they have a perfect defined Cauchy surface. They are maximal developments of regular asymptotically flat Cauchy data. But they have exactly this Penrose diagram. Um, so uh, there are examples that you can construct such that you have this Penrose diagram. Well, you have a bunch of other sort of examples that you can construct, actually, that maybe will be useful pedagogically to understand some of the differences between the conjectures. So you can, uh, you can construct examples that look like this. And I'll explain these pictures uh, in a second. And uh, you can also construct examples that look like this. So maybe to make this clear, I'll write r goes to infinity here. And in principle, you, you can imagine that there are examples. So let me not, well, not that I've told you what these conventions would mean, but anyway, let me, <laughs> let me write it like this. You can have examples like this. So, um, so what are these examples that I've just drawn? So again, this is always null infinity. So here you have what we had previously. That's to say, uh, incomplete null infinity uh, and a Cauchy horizon coming from a first singularity across which you can extend the solution. Okay. So in some sense, this does not satisfy the predicate of either of those two states. Now you have this, okay? So this has a complete null infinity. I'm telling you that. It's not implicit in the diagram, but I'm telling you that. Um, it has a bit of Schwarzschild-like singularity here, but there's a, a piece of Cauchy horizon coming from a first singularity across which you can extend. So this satisfies the predicate of the, what's written there, but not uh, the predicate of the strong cosmos. Okay, because you can extend. Okay, not infinity, but you can, can extend. Okay. Now here, uh, well, I, I'm telling you that uh, uh, null infinity is uh, complete. Okay. And moreover, uh, r equals zero here. So let me make this um, look singular. So this is a space-time that satisfies both of those predicates. But interestingly, there, there's, no, there's no black hole region. Okay? So somehow, this is one of the reasons why I, I actually, in, in the formulation of weak cosmic censorship, um, you, know, you might not want to impose that there be a black hole as opposed to just saying that future null infinity is, is, is complete. And then here, this, this picture, um, you have a, a somehow a singular boundary going all the way to infinity, all right, such that uh, null infinity is not complete. Okay. So you can imagine this type of a situation. All right. So this situation would satisfy strong cosmic censorship, but not weak. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is just to emphasize that. Um, the <laughs> these traditional epithets are not to be taken literally. Okay, these statements are actually completely independent. All right. So he constructed all these examples. By the way, these examples are not uh, somehow explicit. They're not uh, enclosed forms. You prove that they exist somehow. They are, in some sense, things that you construct with mathematical analysis. Okay. So uh, these are not uh, closed form solutions. But this is exactly the point of mathematical analysis. You can, uh, you can construct them nonetheless. Okay. So this is one thing. So in particular, uh, because of this, uh, this immediately tells you that 
uh, well, in both of these conjectures, uh, you certainly at best can hope for the conjecture to be true generically, for generic initial data. Okay? Because there are particular examples of initial data for which the conjecture, the predicate of the statement is false. Okay? So <laughs> at best, you can show that it's true generically. And then he showed that it's true generically. Okay? So uh, this was, um, I guess, 1999. So what he showed is if you start with generic initial data, okay, this is a picture of generic initial data, right, then there are two possible situations. Okay? Either you disperse, so that's to say the Penrose diagram is like in Minkowski space, right, with complete futurinal infinity and inextendable space time. Or you form a black hole, and the, the Penrose diagram looks exactly like this. Okay, so like actually in the original Oppenheimer-Snyder model. Okay. So for generic initial data, so for generic spherically symmetric initial data of this system, this or this. So actually, uh, he showed something slightly stronger than this. And uh, I'll make reference to this just to give you some intuition for why is this finally true. Okay. So I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll give you an epsilon of the argument, of, no pun intended, of, of why, this is, why, why this is true by giving you an epsilon of, of the proof, because it's the proof that tells you why it's true. So, um, so suppose you're looking in the phase space of all solutions, okay, near a solution that has a first singularity here. Okay. Of course, if there were no such solutions, then you can easily show that well, there would be nothing to do. Then you'd always have <laughs> this picture. Okay. So suppose you you are uh, precisely uh, at, you know, you, you <laughs> you're looking at, the, sort of, you're in the phase space of all solutions, okay, and you're looking you know, near a solution, all right, which forms a first singularity, okay? So, which has, that's to say, a Penrose diagram that looks like this, and I don't know yet what it looks like afterwards. Okay. So, well, suppose the, the Penrose diagram looks like this. That's to say, in this case, then it's easy to show that this is stable. Okay, so in some sense, there's nothing to do. All right. Suppose, however, that no, uh, the Penrose diagram looks like this. Let's say. Okay. So this is perhaps going to be a naked singularity. Perhaps it will be visible uh, to infinity. Perhaps it will be, you know only locally naked in the sense that this would be a Cauchy horizon. I don't care. I just care that somehow you have sort of the space time exists up to there. Just to say you don't have this, this singularity coming. Okay, so suppose you're in this situation. Then uh, the first thing that uh, Sotulu showed is that there is a blue shift associated to this in the following sense that if I, if I have somehow uh, an observer here, who sends a signal in this direction. And I look at a suitable family of observers like this, who cross this null cone at a later and later time. Okay? They will receive this signal more and more blue shifted. Okay? So there is some effect that you might hope, you might hope creates an instability. The problem, however, is that, well, <laughs> this type of an analysis, sort of saying there's a blue shift effect, is completely linear. And it's the usual story. If indeed this linear instability starts to kick in, then 
Well, because it's kicked in, you're going far away from sort of the regime of linear theory. So after a certain cutoff, well, you're not learning anything from this analysis. And um, actually what, what uh, Christodoulou showed is the following, that there's a certain sort of <laughs> universal amount of energy concentration in an annular region. So you can think that the region between these two null cones, if I actually draw it upstairs, okay, so these are two null cones. Okay, so you can think of this annular region between these two null cones. Okay. So there's a certain amount of energy which if somehow the energy concentrated in this region as a, as a function of the size, the angular size of this region is sufficiently large, then you are ensured that the so-called trapped surface will form in the future. So th this is actually quite mysterious that you can prove such a statement because this statement you can prove it irrespectively of sort of how far the geometry is from sort of uh, Minkowski geometry. So it's really something remarkable. And then essentially what he shows is the following, that if somehow you're, you have a particular solution that looks like this, okay, then uh, you can embed this particular solution in a one-parameter family of solutions in moduli space, okay, such that for each other member of the family, all right, <laughs> Originally, there will be some, you can think of it like this, some regime where linear effect will concentrate energy here to some level. And then this completely general fact will uh, force you to have trapped surfaces here. So this is, uh, in some sense, the reason why it's true in this model. Um, it's very different from the sort of naive idea that uh, you get black hole formation because uh, sufficient energy uh, condenses into, into a ball. This is really about uh, energy concentration in, in angular regions. So what drives the mechanism is that uh, you have sufficient, you have a lot of energy in an angular region uh, <laughs> in proportion to the, the angular size of the region, the annular size of the region. So, so this is the so this is the mechanism, and uh, with this mechanism, he was able he was able to prove this. All right. So, um, so that's great. Uh, weak weak and strong cosmic censorship, in particular, are true for the for the Einstein scalar field model. But if you remember uh, the discussion about strong cosmic censorship, I, I motivated it in some sense by comparing uh, the Schwarzschild space time to the the Kerr space time. And um, so you remember the issue in the Kerr space time. So the Kerr space time had, let me go over here now. Um, so the Kerr space time. So maybe I'll, I'll draw again Schwarzschild. So remember that. Schwarzschild was this two-ended asymptotically flat spacetime that looked like this to the future of initial data. And the Kerr spacetime thought of as the maximal Cauchy development of Kerr initial data looks like this. So this was nicely inextendable. All observers going to the boundary are destroyed. But uh, this one is not. In particular, somehow, uh, the spacetime can be extended in uh, an infinity of ways uh, beyond this boundary. And uh, observers can safely, all, in fact, incomplete observers in the original spacetime can, can safely pass into this extension. And, well. <laughs> In some sense, we conjectured this exactly because we were uncomfortable with 
the uh, issues of determinism, or the lack thereof, that this gave, gave rise to. So, um, so it turns out that, well, you see, in this model, you might have noticed, you have all of these funny examples. But I never drew for you a, an example where you had a, a Cauchy horizon coming from here. Because in, in this model, you can prove that that never happens. Okay? It, it's not possible to have uh, Cauchy horizons coming from here in the collapse of a field. So somehow this model is very nice. You can prove these conjectures, but it sort of <laughs> it does not allow it <laughs> this phenomenon that well you know for the vacuum without spherical symmetry is there. Okay. So uh, what can you do to sort of uh, also entertain this issue in this uh, proxy world of, of toy models? Well, well, first of all, we all know that there is a spherically symmetric version of this, but it's not the, the Kerr solution of the vacuum equations. It's the Rice or not some solution of the Einstein Maxwell equations. Okay. So we know that if we add in the Maxwell equations, then we can get this in spherical symmetry. Okay. In fact, somehow this Penrose diagram is actually, if you want, uh, the Penrose diagram of Rice or Nordstrom, because only for spherically symmetric spacetimes do these diagrams sort of have a formal meaning. So that's great, but, but uh, if you just look at the Einstein-Maxwell system, then you have exactly the same uh, problem that you have in spherical symmetry when you just look at the Einstein system. <laughs> Namely, the, the only solutions are the Einstein-Maxwell equations. And then, well, if, if you want, you, you prove that well, <laughs> uh, strong cosmic censorship is, is false because generically, that's to say unless the charge is zero and you have Schwarzschild, then this is, these, these solutions are the generic ones, okay. because <laughs> these are the only ones. So what, what you can look at is actually, you can look at the Einstein-Maxwell scalar field system. And, um, and I'm going to couple these in sort of the, the most benign way. That's to say, this scalar field will be a massless, uncharged scalar field. Okay, so in fact, these are not directly coupled. So, um, well, if you want to do that, then uh, you, you still always have to consider non-trivial topology if you want the Maxwell part to be non-trivial. But in some sense, because uh, this model gives a satisfactory sort of understanding of what's going on here, okay, and I'm really interested in what's going on here, then I, I'm prepared now to sort of, you know, look in this world of uh, two-ended initial data, and you, know, you are, you should understand all the caveats of the, of the previous time as far as two-ended initial data. So now, uh, this model we can set in gener we can talk about generic initial data, and, and we can ask what, what happens. And um, well, in some sense, the original expectation, um, in fact, this was in some sense what led Penrose to conjecture this in the first place, is that uh, upon perturbation of Reisner or Nordstrom data, then you'll fall into this situation. So, uh, so the first statement that you can make is the following. So by the way, I should, I should add something that uh, any time you have two ends in spherical symmetry and reasonable matter, uh, you can prove weak cosmic censorship for whatever it's worth. Okay? So the issue of weak cosmic censorship is not, uh, it's true in this model, in this setting, but sort of essentially trivial. I mean, completely trivial, but essentially. So you start with generic initial data here, Null infinity will always be complete. That's not an issue. You can prove that. So what does the boundary of space-time look like? So statement one, unless this region here is asymptotically Schwarzschild or asymptotically extreme Reisner Nordstrom, okay, then there will always be a null piece of the boundary. So that's sort of the first statement that you can prove. There will always be a null piece of the boundary. And moreover, you can always extend the space-time beyond this 
as a continuous Lorentzian metric. So in particular, if, if here you, by suitably regular, you only meant continuous Lorentzian metric, okay, then um, this in particular tells you that uh, the statement is false already in this model. Okay. So um, that's, uh, that's uh, one statement. Um, statement two, however, is the following. If the data is generic, then these null boundaries, so the boundary is always null, okay? But these null boundaries here, okay, uh, will be singular in a weaker sense. Okay. And in particular, you can show that uh, if you require that this Lorentzian manifold has square integrable Christoffel symbols, okay, then, uh, then uh, this is true. Okay, the, the generic, for generic initial data, um, somehow the, these null boundaries will be singular in a way that you cannot extend the metric so as to have square integrable Christoffel symbols, so in particular, uh, so as to have finite curvature. So in particular, the, the curvature of the so anyway, I mean, I, I should say that sort of the heuristic picture of this goes back to work of uh, Hiscock, uh, Israel Poisson, and uh, Amos Ori. And uh, so I, I, I proved this for this model then uh, 10 years ago. So let me just say one more thing and finish the talk. Um, so uh, this, this was surprising um, already, sort of when even just as a heuristic picture uh, it was proposed and there were many uh, numerical results which uh, first instance gave contradicting <laughs> answers. And uh, a, a lot of the, <laughs> a lot of the uh, difficulty was caused by the fact that there was a lot of attachment to the idea that generically the singular boundary of space-time should be space-like should be space-like everywhere. So the idea that uh, part of uh, this boundary is null, uh, people thought that this could not be right. Um, so OK, in this uh, statement, I've told you that the little part of this uh, boundary is null, but maybe there's still a, a, sort of a space-like part that everyone can be comfortable with. But uh, it turns out that um, uh, if you look at small, but any small perturbation of Reisner or Nordstrom data in this model, then you can show that actually the whole boundary is null. Okay. Let me just end by saying the following, that uh, I have no doubt that uh, this statement, uh, namely that um, this statement but in the vacuum case, so namely that if you, if you take Kerr initial data and look at sufficiently small perturbations of Kerr initial data, and look at the maximal Cauchy development of this data, all right, that uh, the boundary of the maximal Cauchy development will be entirely null. Uh, and generically singular, but always entirely null. Uh, and moreover, I, 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 this will be the first statement about generic singularities which will be proven uh, for the Einstein vacuum equations. So it's very important not to get distracted by by this notion, it sort of <laughs> it caused a lot of um, it caused a lot of confusion in the subject, and sort of uh, we now know that <laughs> this is not really going to be the picture. So in any case, this is this is uh, what I'll say. I, I didn't really give any discussion of why sort of why this is true. Um, let me just say that uh, as in the case of uh, weak cosmic censorship here, it is fundamentally related to a, a blue shift instability. Um, but somehow the instability is not sufficiently strong to destroy the space time before this boundary, it's simply that it makes this boundary sick. All right, so ah, that's, uh, that's it. Okay, thank you.